Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be starting a brief series on this really cool game that came out very recently called Fly Out. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this game, well, basically somebody saw the game of X-Plane and was playing with the plane editor and said, I bet you I could make a game like that. And uh, they did, and they did a wonderful job of creating this environment where if you can think about it as far as something that flies, you could probably make it, and the physics are pretty darn good. Uh, there are a lot of little things. Obviously, we're in early access here. I think up on the big screen, we're like version 0.216. So some of the things you might see here today are going to be probably possibly out of date, uh, depending, of course, uh, sort of where we sit. Uh, the purpose of this uh, short series, of course, is to introduce us to the major power plot supplies, you know, our jet engines, uh, we have our turboprops, and we have our piston planes, as well as kind of how to tweak them and make them work for yourself. So today's video, of course, is going to be dedicated to our good old-fashioned friend, the piston engine, as well as the propeller mounted to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by going ahead and create myself a test bench here. Now, my test bench is um, this giant cube. I made this cube already, and I tweaked its size. I've had a ton of fun. I filled it up with some AV gas. Uh, this little cube here, too. I'm just going to toss some AV gas in here, too. Now, you're probably sitting here going, okay, why is there one jet A and AV gas and all these other guys? Uh, believe it or not, all these different fuels have different properties that can have a big impact on the performance of your particular aircraft, as well as the engine and everything kind of self-contained within. Now, we're not going to get into this too far today, but know that each one of these has a specific definition. As a matter of fact, if you were to go into your little Steam library folder, you can actually see these definitions directly. Uh, the reason these are really, really good is they have this thing called stoichiometric ratio. Uh, this is important for us because this is going to be telling us exactly what air fuel ratio we need to use. You'll notice here my AV gas is a magic 14.7 uh, here. This is actually an interesting problem in deal with that later. But when we get to butanol, you can see that we're much, much, much richer. Uh, when we get to ethanol, which is a really funky fuel, uh, you can see, look at how rich that needs to be. It's a lot of fuel. Uh, ice octane here uh, goes back to normal. It's actually kind of a low density, but plenty of energy capacity. And of course, uh, Jet A, which yes, you can run a piston engine on Jet A. It's uh, called a diesel. Uh, the big thing you'll notice here is that our psychometric ratio is just slightly different. So now that we have our test bench all set up and we know what our, air, our specific stoichiometric ratio, again, air to fuel, we can go ahead and get started. So I'm going to start by a shut off symmetry mode, press my plus button, I'm going to go ahead and get power, and I'm going to grab myself one of these uh, lovely uh, engines here, so a piston engine. Now, one of the things I find very fascinating with this game is the fact that there's definitely a bias towards jets. I'm not saying that that is a bad thing. I'm just saying uh, there's kind of a, you know, jets are generally going to be simpler. Uh, once you get into piston planes, things are going to get complicated from a cooling perspective, from a propeller perspective, from a boost perspective, from an altitude perspective, which is why we're starting with them. Let's go get going then. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zero all this business out. And I'm going to grab this. and I'm just going to drag it above my little test bench here because I'm going to give myself plenty of room in which to fiddle with this. And of course, uh, this is our engine. And over here on our right are going to be all the various stats of our engines. So we have a couple different things we can do, of course. Uh, we can select the arrangement. Uh, sadly, there is no boxer arrangement. Uh, that actually surprises me. Uh, the reason being is the fact that uh, many traditional engines that we have for small propeller planes are almost always boxer arrangements just for aerodynamics. But you can see here we can do radial, uh, we can do a V arrangement, and we can do an inline arrangement as well. Now some of you are saying, does it really make that much of a difference if you do that? You know, if I do a five-cylinder engine with this displacement, well, let's take a look real quick. If we open this sucker, you can see that's uh, 500 kilowatts or so. Now if we went with a radial engine that had uh, exactly one row, and you know, we run that one too, you'll notice that 453 there, and of course if we go to a V arrangement. Uh, I don't think we can do a five-cylinder V arrangement, so I'll just pretend that it's like this or something like that. It's obviously going to be a little less, but it's actually not too bad as far as performance goes. So the general arrangement, of course, if you're building a specific engine, this is a good time to run in there. If you're building a flat engine like we're going to use for a demonstration today, uh, I just use V. It's, it's simple. The radials tend to get a little big. The inlines tend to be a little tall. Uh, one of the things I have done in the past is I've actually done a dual inline. I'll show you what I mean by that. I'll take something like this and I'll actually rotate it. Oop. <laughs> If you rotate it to correct the ground, <laughs> one chance. What I'll do is I'll actually do two uh, rows and I'll take one of these, duplicate it, and put it on the other side. And then I have a dual one of these kind of a thing that gives me the simulated boxer look if that's uh, something I want to create for a specific engine design. That's getting a little complicated today. So for today, what I'm going to do is concentrate on the basic good old fashioned boring here. 
Now, once you get to this, there's a couple different parameters that we can adjust in order to get exactly what it is that we're trying to achieve. Now, the first thing, of course, is going to be the number of cylinders. Uh, the more cylinders we have, naturally, the more power we're going to produce. At the end of the day, if you're taking your mouse, you know, roll down here, you're going to see this thing that says displacement 19.3. Oh my God, that's a big V4 engine. But a displacement basically is going to be describing to you how much we displace. Obviously, the more we displace, the more power we can produce. Uh, this goofy little thing right here, for example, if we just plot that again real fast we can see we're at a 374 that's a lot of horsepower that's actually not great but um that's a lot of horsepower and you can also of course when you run it in the game you can get a feel for what is actual you know performances power to weight and stuff like that but uh, the other thing we can do to control power directly of course is increase the number of cylinders if we were to go up to for example i uh, will do a four rows here so now we have a v8 engine you can see we're displacing 38.6 liters or we're getting up towards tank performance and your brain is going to say well 353 times two that's about 700 when you open it up you actually produce better than 700 and uh, the reason for this of course is the fact that uh, you're a more balanced engine and that's an important concept uh, if i grab an inline now let's say i I want to make it something really stupid here i'll make an inline six engine you can't go up to inline eight no, not in this version though you'll notice that um we we suffer a little bit and also the curved shape itself is it got this kind of weird little path because it's not going to be very smooth because of the number of cylinders that you have so again design it based on what you want so what i'm going to do of course is i'm going to recreate an engine that i'm very very familiar with uh, because i do fly in the real world and that's going to be good old-fashioned light combing 360. very very simple engine um i love it it's a very very simple to do one thing you could do is you could actually come up here and rename this so i can call this line combing that's uh, going to be an 0360 and that's going to be my little engine and it kind of helps keeping things organized because when you come back to this page now you'll notice my light combing 360 here is actually listed and uh, makes it much much simpler to kind of hang on to it now, the light coming 360, uh, we know a lot about it. Uh, for one thing we know, we know that its bore is going to be 130 millimeters, and we know that its stroke is going to be about 111 millimeters. Uh, the other thing we know, depending on what version of this you get, uh, it's going to be about an 8 compression ratio. I know that sounds really, really, really low, but the reason the compression ratio on this is so low is on account of the fact that it's an older carbureted engine. Uh, if we turbocharged it, naturally, we'd have to reduce the compression ratio. So the big thing they say, if you pulled your mouse over the little tool tip here, is that a higher compression ratio usually improves efficiency quicker than it improves power. You know, if I come in here and I were to do a quick performance curve, you can see we're 192 kilowatts here. Now, if I, of course, were to crank up the compression ratio, that's going to lead to some really bad knocking. And now I look at it, you can see that is absolutely crushed my power here. Um, all the good power we had is now being wasted because basically you're getting pre-ignition, which is a, not something that's very pleasant. If I were to go up to like a 12, you can see I'm still at 187. If I were to come down to this one and do this again, you can see 222. Let's say I want to come down to 10. I'll plot that again. 19 if we do uh 10 and a half which is usually pretty good uh, let's see what we got here 224 that's actually pretty good um 10 and a half yeah about 10 and a half is going to give us optimum performance for this particular piece here and obviously we'd have to go run it in game real fast Another thing that's really important when you're designing engines inside this program is to keep in mind that this curve here is all the way out to 4,800 RPM, whereas most propellers are going to be turning somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 RPM if they're small, usually somewhere between 800 and 1,200 if they're very, very large. The reason that's important to us is I can see my power peak here is about 3,600 at 225, but I'm more likely to be using it somewhere down in this region where we're going to be um, probably call that 205, 210. So even though we could theoretically use this peak performance, which is very helpful to us when we go to design takeoff power in a minute. Um, that's not necessarily where we're going to be running it. So always kind of keep that in mind. And um, for the purposes of example today, I will run it up to its full power. So anyway, let's continue working with our engine here. I'm going to go ahead and back this back down to what it was. Uh, eight's probably going to be fine for us. That's uh, about 192. This is much too much for the real one. Uh, the real one, of course, uh, has the best performance on a good day of about 140 to 150 kilowatts. So we're a little overpowered here. But keep in mind, it will be detuned because we're going to be coming back this way. So we're actually producing too much power. The next thing we can tweak, of course, is going to be our valves. Now, we have two different choices for valves. Uh, we have a two-valve, or we have ourselves a more conventional uh, four-valve here. Advantage, of course, is um, if you have more valves, you have better airflow. So if I drop this down to two and plot it, notice um, that's cost us a pretty substantial amount of power. But the other thing you probably observed is the fact my curve shifted gently to the left. Now, one thing we can't do in this version of Flyout here is we can't actually come in here and tweak these variables and like really, really get into the minutia of like when the valves open and close, how tight our springs are. We might see that in the future. I'm kind of scared if they do, because uh, then we're going down automation, and that's kind of its own beastie. The other thing we have, of course, over here, and I like I like fuel efficiency, so I'm just going to open up four valves here, is we also have the ability to dictate the size of the valves. Now, the biggest thing about the size of the valves is going to be adjusting 
interesting where the power comes in. Now, if I come down here and I reduce this to, let's say, half, if I were to plot this again, you'll notice my entire curve shifted left here. Uh, you can see we're about 185. If I were a really bad person, I dropped these to like five millimeter valves. I don't know why you do that, but you can see we're actually producing exactly... <laughs> <laughs> Would you look at that? We're actually almost producing exactly the correct amount of power now. It's about 143 kilowatts at 252. So uh, this is the best way to think about the valves is basically tweaking where your peak is going to be here. So about 152, this is actually correct. I've almost got this exactly perfect. And you can see here, my peak power is right around 2700. I'm about 152. I'll go ahead and increase this just a tiny bit more here. I'll go up to a seven millimeter valve here. And again, if you shrunk the amount of valves, you could then double the area. So that gets me a peak power at uh, about 2812. Well, that's pretty good, 157 kilowatts. That's basically exactly what I wanted. And uh, that's that's pretty cool. And it gives you an idea of how you can fit with things or you can leave them alone. There we go. Now that's almost perfect. Bingo. So now we have ourselves pretty much everything we need to do. Now at this stage, of course, we get into the, how do we harness the power of this engine? But before we do that, you probably observed, I have a couple little exhaust valves down here, and I'm actually gonna link them up so that when our engine actually produces all sorts of nasty exhaust, we have a place for it to go. Now, <laughs> I know your brain is going, but sir, there's nothing here. Doesn't matter, relax, just relax. So the next thing we're gonna have control over is of course our superchargers and turbochargers. I'm not gonna touch these yet because these are a little involved. And honestly, um, as you're gonna see, the turbocharger is gonna be the easier of the two to play with, but we'll get there in a minute. Down here, we have our idle throttle. Well, the key thing here is if your engine cuts out on you at idle, uh, just increase this a little bit, but ideally you want this to be pretty low. Our mixture, remember a minute ago when I was uh, showing you what our air fuel mixture was for the fuel? So if you're running ethanol or something like that, you're gonna to have to drop this. Now, what it says in the little tool tip here is if you give it a slightly rich mixture, it's of course going to give you slightly uh, better, um, a little more power kind of a thing. The other nice thing about increasing the maximum fuel, remember, to the left is going to be richer, to the right is going to be leaner. In the real world, by the way, we almost never use 14.7. We use pretty rich. It'd be like 12.5. You know, we have a handle for that in the real plane kind of a thing. The nice thing about enriching the mixture, too, is that enables us to uh, basically run things a little bit higher compression, too, because we have a little bit more fuel to kind of take up some of that energy, so to speak. The RPM limiter is a hard limiter. And uh, the big thing you want to know about this is it's better to use a constant speed propeller to take the edge off of it than to do this action. Uh, if you do this, you're going to find that the PID controller for it will suck all your horsepower away once you get close to 2800 RPM. So generally for this one, I'll leave it at default. It's going to be fine. If you're doing like a Rotax engine or something like that, uh, feel free to come in here and put this up to like 65 or something. But again, these are really big cylinders. Uh, we don't want to be wrecking them that hard. Our flywheel is a neat little tweaking option here. Uh, this is basically going to give us the ability to add a little bit of inertia to the engine itself. Advantage to this, by the way, is um, you're less likely to run away with a heavy flywheel, but if you add the flywheel, you're actually going to be um, hurting performance a little bit because now we have to rotate the flywheel to make it work. So if I make my engine a little bit heavier here, we'll go up to uh, 0.1 here and I plot this again, you'll notice it has no effect on the actual engine performance, but you probably observed that the mass of the engine came up. This is actually a little heavy for a light combing 360, but that's okay, I'm not worried about it. The big thing here is by adding in a flywheel, you stabilize the RPM when it needs to be stabilized. If we have something little tiny, like I said, like a little Rotax engine or something like a 912S or something, these are gonna be tiny. Uh, for really, really big planes, you probably won't even have a flywheel, uh, depending because there's just so much inertia in the crankshaft there. So this looks really, really good. I'm happy with the engine, uh, it works pretty well. The one thing we did not discuss is the difference between air-cooled and liquid-cooled. Uh, the big difference here is if I switch to a liquid-cooled engine, uh, you'll notice that it's got the little manifold here that's designed to have uh, water basically flow through it. If you're going to do that, uh, grab yourself a radiator and uh, when you do that, plug in the engine and go ahead and plug it in as a radiator and uh, that'll basically dissipate the heat. If you're looking for which one should you use, the air-cooled versus water-cooled, air-cooled, we're going to have more difficulty keeping it cool on the ground when we test it. That's a big thing. Uh, when you're in the air, of course, and you're moving pretty quick, uh, the air-cooleds work perfectly fine. Uh, also, in the real world, there's no weight penalty typically for an air-cooled engine. So I think that's just something they're going to tweak a little later on. So we've got our engine. Uh, now it's time to go ahead and throw on the gearbox. And the gearbox here is a little frustrating, and I'll show you why in a second. When you deploy it, um, it's gigantic. Remember, we're working with little engines here. So what I'm going to do is come up here, and I'm just going to scale it down a little bit because it does not need to be that big. Now, the gearbox can be anywhere. I could put this in the middle of the that platform. I could sit on the gearbox. It does not make a difference. Important thing with the gearbox, though, is we need to make sure we connect it to our engine, which you did label. And of course, uh, if we had a second engine, we could actually plug it into a second engine if we wanted to. I've done things like that for really, really complicated propeller arrangements, but I don't normally do that. 
One thing you're going to notice here is there's a clutch option. Um, I'm really impressed by the clutch option. Uh, this is very, very helpful if you're building a helicopter. But the important thing here is going to be our gear ratio. Now, if you remember our engine that we built here, uh, we designed it so that its peak power is right around 2,700 RPM, which now means that this guy needs to be turning at about 2,700 RPM, which means my gear ratio is going to be one. Now, the interesting thing here is we have to use a gearbox. We can't plug this directly into a propeller, which is kind of a shame. Shoot. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to press the plus key. I'm going to go ahead and get myself a propeller. Now, this is where everybody stresses out. Uh, one of the nice things is I have, a, I used to do the competitions in X-Plane in my early days of basically trying to compete. They'd have like an airplane where you have to like design like an airplane that can take off and land in 50 feet and carry like 8,000 pounds or something like that with like a single engine. And those are fun competitions. And I kind of cut my teeth on things like propellers and engines. But um, over in X-Plane, it's actually very similar, but it's a little bit easier. So when I click the propeller, the goal of the propeller, of course, is to turn the torque out of this guy into thrust. So thrust is the biggest measure of success as far as this goes. However, I can't say this enough. Our thrust is dependent on our air speed. Now, let me go ahead and turn my head to the right here. Now, if you look at a propeller and you study it really closely, imagine I have a giant thick block of gel around this propeller. When this propeller makes one revolution through that gel and pulls the well, propeller and motor with it, I should say, you will observe that it kind of makes a helical pattern in it. The distance between this helical and the next helical is going to be your magic pitch. That's going to basically be how much you're screwing through the air. Now, the thing you have to remember is when this propeller is moving, there's actually air coming from in front of it, going through it, which actually pushes this. But it also means that this blade, which is trying to take a chunk out of the air to be able to screw through it, is basically losing efficiency as it accelerates. To make matters more complicated, if you take a look at a propeller itself, you will know that at 2,700 RPM, down here at about the middle cord, oh, this is about halfway across the blade here, this blade, if you were to think about it in terms of linear speed going around like my mouse is at the moment, is probably traveling, oh, let's call it about 0.30 Mach. But my tip is probably traveling about 0.60 Mach, whereas my root, which is right towards the middle, because it's traveling in such a tiny circle, it's only pulling like 0.1 Mach. That means that my propeller blade, if I kept it at the same distance all the way across and did no twisting to it whatsoever, I would actually cause myself to have a decrease in efficiency because the middle is not doing any work and the tip is working too hard, which of course creates vibration. Now, this is a tough, tough calculation. Uh, the people who uh, went and did the math in this one are very enthusiastic because you know, it makes things very interesting for us. And of course, um, we're looking at all these numbers over here going, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm, how am I gonna fix this kind of a thing? Well, the good news is somebody's done a lot of the work for us. Over on the Discord uh, for our lovely flyout game, it's this lovely little tool that somebody posted. Don't worry, it's in the comments if you need it. Um, they created this lovely thing on Desmos, which actually allows us to calculate our propeller pitch. Now, over on the side, of course, we have our angle of attack desired. Uh, this is fine. Five is perfect. Uh, we have the diameter of the prop. Uh, this is important, though, because we have to get this correct. And uh, you'll notice here that my diameter of the prop right now is a one. So if I were to come down here and crank that down or up and down, you have a pretty good idea of what that's going to do to me. So if I said uh, my diameter here is one, you can see that has a pretty substantial impact on the amount of twist my blade has to be. The next is going to be our velocity. Uh, the important thing here with a velocity is that if you look over here, here you're going to notice it's speed in meters per second. 145 meters per second is 300 miles an hour. That's a lot. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reduce and make a little more normal. But let's call it 90. Obviously, if you want it to be a goofball, you could lower this a pretty low. You could say that my top speed in my plane is about 100 knots, which is going to give us a propeller twist like this. Uh, the next thing you're going to see here is this is the optimized RPM. This would be your cruise RPM or Let's be more specific, our highest efficiency RPM. So if of course we were doing 2,700 RPM, we could come right in here and do 2,700 RPM and it gives us this lovely little curve. Now, this is just a reference. Um, this basically, it depends what you want to do here. If you want to make the tip twist zero, uh, this is when you adjust this. Do you see how my tip twist right now is minus 20? What I can actually do here is I can use this sucker. Uh, that was, uh, you know, it took a lot of exertion to move my mouse forward there to go ahead and analyze that. So now if I go like this, I have the profile of my propeller, which is awesome. We know that at the root, we need to be twisted 70 degrees. We know that at the uh, mid range here, halfway through the cord here, and we know that we're going to be at 50, uh, what do you want to call it, 25. And of course, at the tip, we're going to be one. Now, this is so cool because you can actually come up here and click if you want to be one of those people. So if I actually click on this, you can read that value exactly. Uh, so you can see here, 15 degrees. So let's go back over to Flyout, and let's go ahead and punch those values in. 
So we set our root here. I remember that's going to be the 70. So if you look at this thing, it's monster twisted, which is actually pretty accurate. Uh, this one, of course, you said, what was it? 15 degrees at the mid range. And then we set at the tip of zero. So now we have twisted our propeller blades substantially. You can see this thing is cranked. Now, the important thing we need to remember now is this has been optimized for 2,700 RPM, about 125 knots of speed, and with an optimum pitch of, like I said, about 25 there, which was kind of our offset there. So this thing has been optimized for that. Now, the cool thing here is we actually have some tools down here to make our life a little bit simpler. Well, we can set this to a target RPM. Hey, hey, there it is again. And then, of course, we can go ahead and define our pitch range max and minimum. As a general rule, your propeller is happiness. Happiness? That's a new word. Uh, between, uh, let's say, three to seven or eight degrees here. So usually what I'll do is I'll do 20 to 25 in testing. Now, the one thing I always forget to do here is I always forget to set the gearbox up because remember the gearbox needs to actually turn this propeller. Now, the cool thing we have going here is we have a very happy propeller. He's ready to go. And we don't have any idea if this propeller is good enough for our purpose. Now, the good news is I know a little bit about this plane and I can tell you that a propeller blade is actually too small. And also I can tell you because it's based on a Lycoming 360 is we only need two blades here. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to change the blade length just a little bit. We're going to go 1.95 as a Cessna 172. There we go. So we have a slightly wider blade. And now we are ready for testing. So let's go ahead and fire the sucker up. And it is a lovely day to test things. So a couple things we want to check first. Uh, we want to make sure the engine does not cut out. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty critical. If I click down here, we get a little engine display here. So I'm in a couple things. I'm going to right click on my propeller so that we can kind of see the two sets of data. I'm actually just about at idle here. I need a higher idle RPM here. So I can see here that at idle, uh, my engine's producing eh, about seven or eight kilowatts, which is fine. Plenty of torque here. Uh, the propeller is absorbing everything. You can see I'm producing, ho, ho, ho. That's a quite a bit of thrust. I know that doesn't seem like a big number, but if you want to think about it in another perspective, a Cessna 172 produces about 44.8 kilonewtons of force at a takeoff power. So this is actually pretty good so far, seeing as I'm literally at idle. Uh, everything looks good. You can actually see the alphas of all the propeller here. And you can also see that right now, a propeller is sitting there, basically fine pitch sitting there at two degrees. So you wouldn't want to let this drop to zero because you won't be able to catch it when it accelerates. What a lot of people actually do is that once we get to the tweaking phase in a second, actually turn my volume down so I can hear myself here. When we get to the tweaking phase, we'll actually be manipulating this quite a bit. So let's go ahead and run it up to about 50% power. So there's a couple things we want to see here. First thing is we want to double check to see uh, what we're like. Uh, 2000 RPM at half throttle probably says that um, we're still pretty fine pitched here. And we are, we're producing about uh, 62 kilowatts here, which that's fair, plenty of torque. Airflow is good. Also, I love the fact my exhaust is blowing it right in the pilot's face. <laughs> There's something that puts a smile on my face there. Key thing there is we're at three kilonewtons of thrust already, which is fantastic. Uh, you don't realize how much thrust this is. This is really, really good. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and bring it up to 75%, which is cruise power. And we can see our cruise power, obviously we're not adjusting the pitch, but notice our propeller is still sitting at fine pitch here. Uh, that's a bad sign for us. Um, if we're still sitting at fine pitch, it means that we could twist it a little bit harder or um, basically, yeah, we're, we're not working hard enough. Or actually, take it around. If um, we're super fine pitch here and we're not starting to cut into the air a little bit, that means our propeller is just a little oversized, but we'll deal with that in a second. Incidence is perfect. Uh, power, we're getting all the power in that we're putting out. It's fantastic. Let's get up to takeoff power. Nice. So if you take a look here, you can see our constant speed propeller is doing nothing. Uh, we're still at fine pitch here, which means our propeller is, it's too much, our propeller is too big. It's basically sucking it out. But what we do see here is we're actually at takeoff thrust. This is great. Uh, one of the reasons this is awesome is because as we start to accelerate down the line, which we're not going to be doing right now because we're not going anywhere, we know that as we got to about probably 20, 30 knots, our thrust would actually increase partially and the RPM would make its way all the way up to 2,700. But because we're still stuck at fine pitch here, our propeller is just sucking too much energy out of the, uh, propel of the thing and we're actually losing power. Because if you look over here, we're only at 134 out of our 150 kilowatts. So go ahead and drop that back to idle and we'll head back to the editor. All right, so we discovered that our propeller is working too well here. Now, again, we took the numbers right off the Cessna 172. Uh, that usually means a couple different things. Uh, one thing we know is uh, probably our root is a bit twisted or that we have too much cord. As a matter of fact, when I look at this propeller from the front, I can see that my propeller blades are a little thick. So what I'm going to do is instead of changing the diameter, I'm simply going to reduce my root cord by about 10%. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. We'll head back to the editor or the tester. All right. Let's see here. Testing, testing. 
All right, punch it. And we're almost perfect. Uh, one thing I'm noticing still, though, is if you look carefully, uh, we're just making 2,700 RPM here. Uh, we're basically making our peak power, which is what we set out to do here. Uh, the other thing you'll probably observe is our thrust is pretty good. We've basically recreated a Cessna 172 with the propeller, and we've, re well, obviously not the rest of the airplane, but we've done a pretty darn good job here. RPM is basically perfect. Thrust is basically perfect for a real 172. But our pitch is still just hanging out there. Uh, that tells us that we can definitely bring down that cord a little more. This time, definitely. There it goes! Yes! We did it. So here we have a uh, good, good, good design here. Our propeller is basically perfectly sized. You can see it's just starting to bounce off. Uh, you need to twist its blade, which means it was well optimized. Uh, we can see we're producing our 4.8, which is almost exactly what we want. But most importantly, our engine is basically producing its peak everything at this particular point, which means not only is our propeller matched, but our engine's working well. Now, the next step of this, of course, is that what we would do is we'd put this onto an airplane and we go fly it around at about 100 knots, about 50 meters a second. So we have the ability to actually check to see whether or not that our performance actually improves. But right now, this is actually really not bad. Like, I'm happy. I'm very happy, especially given how little power we're actually driving the prop with. So let's go ahead and uh, cut this to idle. If you're wondering, by the way, why it's bouncing off of 400 Kelvin here, it's because of the fact that we have radiators. So um, we don't have that issue kind of a thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to pop back to our hangar real quick. So as you can see, this works great. Uh, this is an excellent process. I have a very happy engine. Um, I, normally what I would do is I go save this configuration and go put it somewhere else because it works so well. But I'm not going to do that. Instead, what I'm going to do is we're going to modify this engine and get into the other components. And that's going to be our turbochargers as well as superchargers. Now, one of the ways to think about a turbocharger or supercharger is it's an air pump for your engine, which is an air pump. Basically, by shoving more air into the cylinders, we get to throw more fuel. We're going to have a lot more energy that we can extract from um, kind of that same space, that same displacement. You have two basic families of forced induction here. We have our superchargers, which are going to be devices that basically you gear them directly onto the uh, crankshaft. So as the airplane's engine speeds up, the boost boosts. That makes sense. And then you have turbochargers, which take exhaust gas, and they basically use that to drive a turbine, which runs the compressor, which forces more air into the engine itself. Now, the reason this is so cool is we can do both. Um, but the reason that's not so good is it's a very quick way to destroy your engine. And uh, we'll demonstrate that. Don't worry. So the question, of course, is what do we want to do? Are we trying to improve the performance of our engine at um, all altitudes? Are we trying to improve just the performance of the engine? Are we trying to make it so the engine performance stays the same at any altitude? And all those decisions are going to have to be made before we get into it. Let me show you why. So if I go to my performance curve real quickly, if I increase my altitude to 7,500 feet and press the enter key here, you'll observe that I lose a lot of power. Uh, not only do I lose a lot of power, but you'll see that my peak power here is actually shifted backwards. And I'm actually down here at about uh, 2,000 RPM is where my peak power comes in. Uh, this is very common, by the way, for many, many aircraft. Uh, this is kind of the nature of the beast. You can't make full power. You only make about 75% of power. That's actually a little low. I'm actually kind of surprised about that. If we go up to 5,000, let me try that again. Eh, that, that's still pretty low, actually. I'm actually kind of surprised. That should be a little higher. But again, that's kind of the nature of the beast. So let's say we want to make it so that our engine can produce sea level power, which is about 155 kilowatts. And we want to design it so that it can do that up to 5,000 feet. How would we do that? Well, we add a supercharger, a turbocharger. We could add a supercharger. I wouldn't recommend it. So we're going to throw on a turbocharger. Now, the turbocharger has one key tweaking factor, and that's what they call the pressure ratio. This is the ratio of atmospheric pressure that we're trying to jam into the actual engine itself. The bigger this number goes, the more power our engine can produce. Now, the one thing that they do, which is nice in this program, is they have a limiter here. This is your little manifold, and you can limit the maximum amount of pressure that's shoved into the engine. So, for example, if I were to crank this up to two, which would be double atmospheric pressure being shoved into my little tiny engine here, this would be limited to 1.5, which is a you know, pretty pretty hefty pressure ratio. Now, if I open this up, you'll see that my engine, remember how it was like not bad or whatever? You'll see now that uh, my new peak power is actually 3,300 RPM, which is a lot more. And we've added 100 kilowatts to my performance. Now, let me show you something amazing here. If I go up to 7,000 feet, you'll observe that my 2,700 RPM here is still my peak power, 
but my peak power is now back what it was at sea level. It's almost like I knew that it had, that would happen. Now, the problem with this, of course, is remember, we're limiting the maximum pressure here to a 1.5 bar, or 1.5 times, I should say, which means we're producing a lot of extra power at sea level. Now, what happens if we come in here and reduce this to atmospheric pressure? Now, if we plot this, everybody goes, well, what the heck was the point of that? Look at that. You're producing the same power you were a minute ago. But watch what happens as we get higher. The power stays about the same. As a matter of fact, which you'll notice here, and I think this is a misplot on their part, you'll see that my power at set 27,000 feet remains almost exactly the same and at the same position as it did at sea level. This concept is called turbo normalization. And the reason it's so popular in high altitude aircraft is you can keep that sea level power all the way up to really, really high altitudes. Now, let's say I went up to 25,000 feet here. <laughs> Gone. But if I were to up the pressure ratio on this thing to say four, you'll notice that I still can produce a little tiny bit of pressure in here. Uh, not a ton, because um, you can see uh, there's a little bit of calculation goofiness going on in here. And I'm not, not stressing about it. But the fact is, I can still produce power at those altitudes without harming my low altitude performance, which if you take a look, hasn't really changed all that much. It's going to change a little bit because obviously we're going to have a little bit more pressure inside of the cylinders than we did earlier. This is a great tool. Now, for a lot of people, people say, well, that's nice and all, but I really, really want to be able to use the turbocharger to go faster. Can you get more power out of this engine? Yes. And now you could do that, of course, by changing the maximum expected pressure. Now, if you're a bad person, of course, you could set the pressure ratio on the turbocharger to four and you could set the maximum pressure to four. <laughs> so um, let's plot that. Uh, that gets us, uh, let's see here, 154 kilowatts. And you're probably sitting here going, that's terrible. I thought it was going to increase the pressure. Why did it not work? Well, let's go up to 10,000 feet here. There we go. That's almost a thousand horsepower. Now you're probably sitting here going, wait, why don't I always do this? Um, I'll show you. Let's go ahead and head back into the simulator and see what happens. You know, you feel bad for a propeller sometimes. Pre-ignition! Pre-ignition! So we are knocking right now. <laughs> look at the flames coming in this guy's face. Oh, look at how hot they are. <laughs> so here are my engines slowly dying. And uh, the reason it's slowly dying is because, um, yes, we're producing 500, well, 440 horsepower or whatever. And our boost is fantastic. And look at my exhaust pipes. I love it. But the problem we have here is the fact that my I'm literally detonating inside the cylinders right now. And this is, this is no good. It's hurting my power. As a matter of fact, if I back the throttle out a little bit, You'll see my power went up, even though I'm at less throttle because I'm no longer basically detonating here. Look at all hot those are. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. This guy's face is going to be so, like, just covered. Like, it's got to have a little bit of neck showing. It's just going to be all black right there. But as you can see, we did get a lot more power out of my little Lycoming 360 here. This is my Lycoming Ultra Supercharge, or Turbocharge. We'll get to Supercharges in a minute. But as you can see, we also have Knock. And uh, there's a couple different ways we can solve the pre-detonation here. Um, the simplest method, of course, is we could just back up the maximum pressure. We could drop the... Sorry, to about 3.9, for example. The other thing we could do too is we could bring down the compression ratio. So if I go down to, let's bring my compression ratio down to about seven or so. Now, if I load it back inside our simulator here, you can see that it's still detonating. Now, at least it's detonating half. Uh, we'd probably have to drop our compression ratio to like 6.1 or something to cancel out all of it. But you're still probably observing here that I have a 360, very, very tiny engine with a power to weight ratio of almost three and a half kilowatts per kilogram which is insanity. Also, my pro propeller in the front is like, look at this, it's all the way to 25 degrees. So my original propeller, by the way, notice the thrust has not improved here. It's actually worse because uh, it's no longer optimized. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? But uh, the key thing that you need to know here is um, we can use turbochargers to improve performance and that works. So let's go ahead and take a look at superchargers now. So turbochargers are great. Um, I love them. My favorite thing to do with the turbocharger, of course, is um, basically like I showed you where you can set it up so you can normalize your power so you have the same amount of power at any altitude. And of course, once you start turbocharging, you have to fix the propeller. A lot of times it'll just stick like two or three more blades on it and that kind of fixes it, but that's getting kind of fancy. So I'm gonna go ahead and restore my compression ratio and I'm gonna snap the turbocharger off and then we're gonna look at superchargers.
Superchargers are interesting. Well, what they do is they have two different versions. You have what they call a single speed supercharger, a low altitude, uh, basically an all altitude supercharger. And then you have a two speed where you basically have a high gear and a low gear. Uh, the purpose being, of course, is at low altitudes, you keep the thing in a different gear so that you don't overboost the engine. When you get to high altitude, you flip the high gear and basically give yourself uh, quite a bit of extra boost. Now, the thing you're going to notice here is they have two separate pressure ratios. Thank the maker that we don't have to figure out the gear ratio here. We can just do the pressure ratios. Now, if we do a two-speed supercharger here, we can set the two. We can actually adjust the altitude. Ah, it's got to be meters. Um, we can actually adjust the altitude here so that it makes more sense for us when we go ahead and initiate it like this. So for us, we're going to keep a single speed, and we're going to make it just a very, very simple two-to-one pressure ratio here. Very, very straightforward. Nothing extreme here. Now, one of the things you'll notice here, of course, if we go down my performance curve, is you'll notice my performance curve gets a weird shape to it. Uh, you'll notice that we have tons and tons and tons and tons of torque right here, and then it slowly dies away like it normally does, and then it slowly builds itself up from power, and you can see where the supercharger basically starts sucking all the power to the engine, it drops off. What you'll observe here is we're producing about 251 kilowatts, which is it's an improvement, it's quite a bit. And of course, you'll notice, remember, we set the max pressure up here. So if we wanted to be goofy, we could set the max pressure at like 1.5 and like really limit this thing. Again, I don't know why you would. It's just going to push this this way. And of course, if you limit it at 1.0, you have just created the world's first um, basically supercharged normalized engine, uh, which would simply mean if I increase my altitude here and plot that again, you'll observe the fact that that shifts uh, quite nicely just like that as well. It's just kind of one of those where it's like, huh, I guess you could do that, but I just don't know why you would because you're going to kill your fuel economy because the supercharger runs off of your crankshaft. So it might not be the best option there. So of course, the big thing with superchargers is additional power. So what we're going to do is that we're going to play with this a little bit so we can see what it looks like inside of the game before we uh, start getting too extreme here. I'm actually going to increase my max manifold pressure. I'll go back up to four here. Again, that's just basically a blow off valve. And that's going to give us, uh, let's see here, at a, a zero, of course, there's going to be sea level altitude here. That's going to increase my max performance to 251 kilowatts at 3792. Uh, all right, let's head over to the sim. All right, so what are we looking for here? Um, we're gonna see a couple different things. Uh, first of all, you'll observe right now that my manifold pressure is actually one bar. If I cut this, uh, you can see it's gonna drop out to basically uh, whatever sea level pressure is here. But the interesting thing here is, notice my boost here is already pretty high. So let's go pop this up to about quarter. Notice the response is basically instantaneous. I'm at 1500 RPM here. You can see I'm producing about 20. Now if I go right up to 50, there's no delay. The power comes on immediately. See my manifold pressure is climbing pretty quick here. Now, if I stomp on it, you can see it actually overwhelmed the uh, propeller limiter here, and this thing's going to snap up to about 10 degrees. Now, this is actually a fairly well optimized propeller for this particular engine here. We're only producing almost exactly the same thrust we were before with an extra 50 horsepower, or or kilowatts, I should say, here, just to give you an idea of how we've actually hurt our situation because we haven't optimized the propeller correctly. The cool thing here, though, is you're observing that we're producing a pretty hefty amount of power and it was instantaneous. And of course, if we climb now, we'll have about the same amount of power to a pretty high altitude. Now, the last thing we'll take a look at, and I'll wrap this video up because we've gone on plenty today, is the concept of optimizing this engine for a turbo and a supercharger. Now, some people are like, why would you mix both? Well, if you remember, the supercharger is better at powering the low end, and a turbocharger is better at powering the upper end. Ah, I see where we're going there. So the way this works is really, really simple, and thankfully we don't have to worry about too much of the uh, minutiae here. But the idea here is, is that once we have a turbocharger, we can then go ahead and use these to work together. Now, if you observe here, my pressure ratio on the turbo is 2, my pressure ratio on the super is 2, and that's going to give us an overall boost of 3, because 2 minus 1 plus 2 minus 1 plus 1 is going to equal 3. Now, if I take a look at my performance curve here, it gets funky. And if you actually take a look here, um, you can see that our 2700 RPM, which is basically what we're optimizing here for, we're producing about 213 kilowatts, which is pretty good. It's basically a little bit of a boost, not too much. I uh, remember here, our max manifold pressure is uh, limiting us here. Now, if we go up to 1000, you'll see that all of a sudden things start to get a little bit better for us. And again, this plotting tool here is not going to work well. Uh, it's not going to be as good as an in-flight because it's basically making a lot of assumptions to make it work. But you'll observe here that we have this nice 
really smooth torque curve. And if we're at our 2,800, 2,700 RPM, which is a sitting right here in the middle, we're awesome. Uh, we're doing a really, really, really good job here. We're producing still almost like five, 600 horsepower. Now, of course, if we went to come in here and let's limit it to like a normal person's boost level here, I don't mind the orthographic view here. If we come back to it now, I'll go ahead and performance curve it. You'll see that we keep even at a thousand. We're basically about the same. If we go up to 2000 here, plot that sucker, you can see we're keeping this nice, consistent power. Now, if we go up to an absurd altitude, and let's say we put up to 7,000, you'll see we're still producing plenty of power without a lot of change in the natural dynamics of the engine all the way up. Now, you're probably saying, this is great. Uh, why don't we do this all the time? Well, you have to remember when you do things like this, uh, you're going to be hurting your fuel economy, which if you're making a fighter, isn't as big of a deal as is if you're making something like this. So now, of course, uh, as we'll leave our video today, is uh, we'll have some fun. And we're going to go ahead and increase the number of blades here. We're going to go up to a four blader here. Uh, we're going to come in here. We're going to increase the uh, valve size a little bit here. We're going to go ahead and uh, take the compression ratio. And we're going to pull it down to, uh, we'll do five and a half. Why not? Uh, we'll increase this to four. We'll go ahead and boost this to four. We'll increase that to four. Looks good to me. Looks good to me. We're going to enrich in the mixture a little bit. Uh, we need a little bit of a rich mixture to kind of cancel out the insane effects I'm about to create. And uh, yeah, that should do it. <laughs> I've, I've felt bad for propeller hubs before, but, um... <laughs> oh, yeah, there it is. Speed of sound, everyone. Woo! So, as you can tell by the noise and the right red exhaust, things are going pretty well for this engine right now. But realistically, we could optimize it even more and probably get 1,200 horsepower into something that only displaces six liters. So hopefully this video is uh, helpful for the purposes of uh, kind of giving you an idea of how to run engines in here. Uh, the big thing you have to remember is that your performance in the propeller engines is only as good as, um, I should say propeller engines, what am I saying? Your performance of reciprocating engines is only going to be as good as the energy you can extract from it by the propeller. Uh, we went over how to get the propellers themselves. Like I said, I got a little link down to the Desmos. I can't take credit from that. I stole it off the Discord and it saved me a lot of frustration. And then the thing you have to remember too is we have to test this thing in flight at those speeds to make sure we're getting the right thrust. Uh, one of the things I did want you to observe though was even when we had almost twice the horsepower, it didn't necessarily improve the performance because our propeller was no longer optimized for that particular RPM range. Enjoy.